And here comes everybody. You feel like God being able to mute everyone. Huh? You feel like God being able to keep everyone. There you go. Mute. <laughs> You're in charge, but not before we get to say hi. Oh, <laughs> I know. Where How I'm are you? It's good to see you. It's, How's great. It going? it's great to see you. Oh, I'm glad you came. It's really nice. Thank you. Okay. Thank all right. You. We'll be quiet now. It's all good. <laughs> We're so excited. All righty. All right. So that you can have the full hour, I'll take the last minute prior to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. You've all been muted because as I explained to Dr. Anderson, St. John's is a friendly place. And by the time everybody gets done saying hello, the session will be over. So, and we don't want that. So we're gonna be muted until um, Kelly decides to take questions and she can unmute us. And uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions, and I'm sure you will, or comments, just put them in the chat. But we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Kelly Anderson. And now I'm going to be quiet. Yeah, okay. Uh, perhaps we can start with a prayer. Is that, is that all right? So let's begin in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming. This is going to be a rather uh, technical presentation. And the good news is if you can't take it anymore, you can just get on your phone and pretend like you're listening. So these Zoom sessions are, uh, are uh, good that way. All right, so what I thought I would do is, um, because we're using Zoom, we'll try to make the best of it, the most of it, is I thought I would do a slideshow because it, it's nice if we can um, also look at it. So we'll start the... Uh, okay, so that's, that's it. So this is what we're going to try to answer the question in this series. Um, can we can we ascertain when the biblical books were written and uh, and who wrote them? And this is the answer is the short answer is we, we really don't know. We don't know a lot, but that doesn't mean we don't know anything. So what we'll try to do tonight is maybe look at um, some techniques and some things that scholars try to use to ascertain the dating of books. And then we'll do one example. I thought we could look at Psalm one. All right. So. This is the methods that are used. So we start with the most concrete, the most concrete things, and we go to the least concrete. So I would say the first two are the most uh, concrete and the most empirically accessible. So we look at the manuscript tradition, the actual documents that we have in our hands. Because if we have a document, we can date it, then it must have been written by that date. Right, you can't get clearer than that. So that gives us the latest possibility of when it would have been penned. Then the other thing we look at is, well, what are they talking about? What event are they talking about? So if someone is discussing the life of David, it must be after the life of David, unless it's prophecy, but there's really no prophecy concerning David. So we don't have to worry about that. So if David is 1000 BC, and we have a document dated to say, I don't know, the eighth century AD, then we can narrow it down to a good 1800 years. All right, you see how difficult the process is? No, it's not quite that bad. But so those are sort of the bookends that we look at. What is the event that they are writing about? Because that's, that's, got, that's gotta be the earliest thing. And then we look at any empirical evidence that we can have in our hand. And then from there, we try to narrow it down a little more. All right, does that make sense so far? Okay. What are some of the things that we do to try to narrow that timeline a little bit more? Well, we look at external witnesses. What do the external, what does the external evidence say about it? That's usually for the New Testament, but not only, all right? We look at the language that's used. Is the language archaic? Um, are there certain loan words? So for example, we have, um, if, if we start to see the word burrito cropping up in English, we know we're not in Shakespearean times. All right, we know that that's when the English language and the Spanish language had contact with one another. So we can look at that. Then we can look at certain themes. Certain themes are later in, um, as, as the, as the um, Israeli, as the Israelites progress through their time in history, certain themes begin to develop and you can see them kind of clearly. So if a writing has a certain theme that helps us to narrow it down maybe to that era. 
And then we look at types of writing, types of writing. Okay, so let's go through each of these then, all right? And we will probably spend the most time on number one because that is the most empirical and we'll see what, what, where, where we go with it, all right? So I'm going to start then with the manuscript tradition of the Old Testament, the Old Testament. So these are the oldest biblical documents that we know of, all right, regarding the Old Testament. Now, there are, um, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew and it was translated into Greek sometime around the third to the second century BC, all right? So what we wanna look for then are Hebrew documents, and we want to look for Greek documents. Now, I have some, um, because this is being recorded and you can go back and look at it, I took the liberty of putting some, um, some sites in here that we can go and look at. The two major sources for the Hebrew Old Testament are going to be the following, and we'll look at each of these. Number one is the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, and those are quite ancient. And then we'll look at the Masoretic texts, and we'll look at two codices in particular the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex. All right, then we will turn our attention to the major sources for the Greek Old Testament, also called the Septuagint. And here, since I have these here, I might as well show you what they are. Um, so hang on a second, I have to get out of, uh, I have to get into this mode. I know there's a way that you can put this on there and then you go straight to the, uh, the site, but we'll do things the old fashioned way because I don't know how to do it. So if you take that and you, um, you, you go to that link that I, that I put in the PowerPoint, these would be the Hebrew manuscripts. All right, so this is, the, this is the big one, the Aleppo Codex, we're gonna talk about that. All right, so that's 930 AD. That's in a Masoretic text, so we'll come back and look at that. And then we'll take a look also at the Codex, uh, the, the Leningrad Codex. And then these are a little bit, uh, these, these aren't complete, so we won't look at those. All right, so if you want some in, more information, then you can go take a look at that if, if you'd like, but we'll, we'll cover that. <clears throat> that same site also has a, has a nice um, compilation as well of the Greek Old Testament manuscripts. So if you want just a short overview of each of these, we'll look at all three of these, Codex Synacticus, and then we'll look at Codex Vaticanus, and then we'll look at Codex Alexandrinus. So those are the big three. All right, so I thought we can't do everything. There's too many, but I thought at least we could look at those. All right, so let's take a look then at the Hebrew sources for the Old Testament. All right, and so we can begin then with the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> the Dead Sea Scrolls, as we know, were discovered in 1947. And from 1947 to 1953, the caves around Qumran were examined and it yielded um, quite, quite a few documents. There's about 973, what they would call manuscripts and thousands and thousands of fragments, thousands of fragments. So I thought I would just show you some of these, this particular site. And I see I got it to work there. All right, so this is the digital Dead Sea Scrolls. These are the major scrolls that were found. And you can see here that there's five of them. One of them is a text from scripture, it's Isaiah. Then these other ones are not scriptural texts. This is a war scroll. This is a commentary on Habakkuk. This is a temple scroll. And this is a community rule scroll. So out of the, um, the witnesses that we have to the Dead Sea, uh, uh, to, to the scriptures, we have actually, oops, very few, pardon me, which are complete, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. We have very few completed uh, texts in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls of the scripture. I'll just show you this. This is an excellent site here. If you wanna go back and peruse this. What this does is it has 209 fragments. And we say fragments, we mean fragments. All right, so I'll just show you one or two of these. They put them in the order of the, um, of, of the Bible, all right, not when they were found or what cave they're in. So you can read it like this. One refers to the cave in which it was found. Q refers to Qumran, and then Genesis refers to what it is. Okay, so you can see this one over here, one Q, and then we see that Paleo Leviticus. That means that it's written in a different type of script. 
like an ancient script. So we might have say like cursive and then printed. So it's something like that. So these, the normal script would be block, that's blocks. And then you've got your Paleo script, which is a little bit more, um, they're not blocks. So let's just take a look at one. All right, you can see how, I mean, these are really truly fragments, right? These are what the pictures of what these would be. Actually, maybe we could look at a better one. Here, this is a little bit clearer. You can see how small these little guys are, right? There's just a couple letters on each of them. So there's thousands of these. And some of them, they don't even know what they are. There's not enough witnesses to them. So when we say fragment, we mean fragment, all right? This is not really a full text of, of, of Deuteronomy at all. We've just got little tiny pieces, okay? Oops, let me just go back here, pardon me. Okay, so the Dead Sea Scrolls cannot give us um, the full manuscript, but what they can do, because they were discovered in 1947 and they are dated anywhere from the third to the first century BC, we know that these texts would have been compiled by that point. And every uh, Old Testament book is attested to with the exception of Esther. There is no, uh, there are no fragments of Esther found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is very interesting. But all the other Hebrew books are attested to, at least in fragmentary form, okay? You can find the Dead Sea Scrolls today in Jerusalem. This is a picture of the museum. So this is the outside. They tried to make it look like a scroll. And then you go in, they try to make it look like the inside of a scroll. Isn't that fascinating? And then you can walk around and you can see some of the major manuscripts that are on display there. And there, I put this just to fill it in. Okay. Where we get to the real depiction though is when we, or, I'm sorry, when we get to the real full text, we have to go to what we call the Masoretic text. The word Masoret, uh, uh, Masora, seems to mean something like to bind. The idea is there to fix or to cement, um, to codify, that's the idea. And then once it's bound or codified or cemented, it can thus be handed down. All right, so that word in, in Hebrew is a little bit difficult to put into one word in English. It has this idea of binding or cementing or fixing with the intent of then handing it on. So the Masoretes are Jewish scholars. So these are the ones who are engaged in the binding or the cementing or the fixing. And they date from the sixth century to the 10th century AD and they're located in Jerusalem in Tiberias. And what was happening at this point is that many of the Jews were forgetting Hebrew. They couldn't read it anymore and they couldn't speak it. And so what the, these scholars wanted to do was to bind or cement a Jewish text. They also wanted to give interpretations on what the words mean and supply indications for how the text should be read. So you can actually learn to read Hebrew without understanding a word of it because of the indications in the text. I think we can do that too with Latin, right? If we learn, we can read it without even knowing what we're reading. Um, all right, so this is what the Masoretes did, and a few of these texts survive. Okay, so this is the difference then between the unpointed text. Let me go back. Remember what I said here, they gave interpretations on what the words mean and supply indications for how the text should be read. Well, how, exactly how did they do that? How did they do that? And so what they did is they developed a system called pointing. They pointed the text. So this would be an example of what we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are far earlier than the Masoretes, right? You notice that these are just letters. Hebrew is read the opposite way in English. So we start on the right and we go to the left. You can see over here, this is the name of God. That's the tetragrammation. It's written a little bit differently, right? Because they didn't want to write the name of God that would have been considered in, in, inappropriate. God is to be reverenced and even to get that close to him as to write his name is something that ought to be avoided. And so when you see these kind of, those kind of symbols there, it's, it stands for, uh, for the name of God. Okay, now this is what we would call a pointed text. So you can see the letters are still there, but what the Masoretes did is they made this system of dashes and dots and indications, All right? So these are accents, so it tells you where the stress is on the word, and there are also vowels, all right? So every single word now has an accent on it, 
and the words are also supplied that also the letters because Hebrew is written without vowels. Uh, it's, it's an odd, it's an odd language. And so they supply these vowels into the text so you can learn how to read it. So that would be an accent. That's an accent. These are vowels that functions as an accent. That's an accent. See that little three over there, those three dots like that. You can kind of see a couple of them. There's three of them all together. That's an E. That's a short E. That stands for a short E. You see those three guys going down like that? That's a U. That functions as a U. Um, let's see if we can find here. This is another a, a dash with two dots there. That's sort of like a, a semi-vowel, they call that. That little one dot, see the singular dot? That's an I. There's another one. There's another I. And sometimes they can stick dots right inside the letter. You see how that's right inside the letter there? And that's right inside the letter there. This guy right here, that little like hat there, they would put one of those in every verse. And that shows where the verse is divided in half. So that's kind of where you take a breath and then you move on and you read the rest of it. So they didn't want to uh, necessarily change the text. Okay, they kept all the letters but they just added these little dots and dashes and indications so that you can learn how to read it and how it should be pronounced where you pause. Okay, kind of functions like a period or, or, a, or a comma or, or, or maybe a semicolon depending. And you know where the stress goes on the word. Sometimes the accent stress is on the top, sometimes it's on the bottom. And so part of then learning Hebrew is learning um, for, for the Jews today is learning their uh, what these points mean. So this right there, this, this word is uh, Moses. So that's your M, that's your O. See that little dot on top there? That's your O. And that makes the S sound, that dot, that dot there. That dot makes it a show. Anyway, so it's all very nice. All right. So that's what the Masoretes did. And you can see how neat and tidy that is. Look at how clear that writing is. That's what they wanted to do, right? They wanted to fix these texts, write them in a clear, coherent way, so that anyone with a little bit of work could have access to this fixed cemented text. This is the oldest, well, it was the oldest complete Masoretic text that we had. This is a very sad story. This is called the Aleppo Codex. So I just put the whole page up so you could see one page, but of course, a biblical scholar would never say page, you would say leaf, you troglite. <laughs> okay, so I have one leaf over here from the Aleppo Codex. You can see these are the, the words with all the dots and dashes. It's not a great picture, I, I couldn't find one better. And then here's the indications in the margins. They give all kinds of indications for how they should be read. These are also numberings to make sure that we have the correct number of words on each line. So these are all, okay, so this would be an example of the Aleppo Codex. Now, the Aleppo Codex is, um, it, was a, it was probably written in Palestine. It might have been written in Palestine. And then it made its way into Egypt at some point. And then it's not exactly clear, but maybe the middle, the middle of the 13th or 14th century, it became housed in Aleppo in Syria. Okay, so it was in Aleppo in Syria. And it was known as the crown of Aleppo. And so it was the oldest, the, the complete uh, Hebrew Bible on the planet. Um, and it was in pristine, beautiful condition. And the Jews in Aleppo were of course very proud of this as, as we could understand. I would be proud too if I had such a treasure in my Jewish community. And up until the middle of the 20th century, the codex remained in very, very good condition. It was treated with great care. But the manuscript, um, because, because of its importance, the Jews in Aleppo didn't really like people to study it. They didn't like it to be touched. They didn't want it to be photographed. And so it was with great um, uh, trepidation that they would let people study it and take pictures of it or copy it down by hand. And you had to work very, very hard to be able to see it. Um, so anyway, the, the codex was not photographed. Um, they were not cooperative when biblical scholars wanted to go in and study it. And they had come to believe that God would protect them if they protected the manuscript. Now, we know what happened in 1947, right? The establishment of the state of Palestine. And this caused riots to break out in Aleppo, in Syria, um, by the Muslim community. And so, 
The story goes like this. In 1948, the synagogue was attacked and it was burned. The synagogue where the manuscript was kept was attacked and burned. And the story circulated that the Aleppo Codex had been burned to the ground, but it wasn't. No, they had hit it. Yes, the Jews went in. They had an inkling that something like this was going to happen, but, but they let the story spread for years that it was destroyed while they kept it hidden. And then it made its way into Israel. At some point around maybe 1953, the Codex made its way into Israel. But what happened is that right now, to date, only about two thirds of the Codex has survived. Uh, a portion of the Pentateuch is missing and nobody knows where it, go, where, where it went. The Jews in Aleppo say, we delivered you guys a perfect codex and you ruined it. The Jews in Israel say, you gave us a messed up codex. Um, so this guy, you can read Matty Friedman, he tried to really dig into this and figure out what happened. What is the real story? And his finding is that, and again, we don't know, but he seems to think that they did in fact, the Syrian Jews did deliver an intact codex. And there was a fellow um, in the Israeli museum who sold it, uh, who sold parts of it. And actually one leaf showed up at a house in Brooklyn and it was returned to uh, the Israelites in, 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 uh, the Israelis in Jerusalem. That was found in 1982, the leaf in, uh, in Brooklyn. So that's, that's a tragedy, that's a tragedy, right? Which, which um, it's not exactly clear why that happened, but now this old, so it's no longer the oldest, the oldest Hebrew manuscript that we have. All right. So what is the oldest Hebrew manuscript that we have? Well, we jump up a little bit more. This is the Leningrad Codex. And again, you can see, this is the Masoretes. See how beautiful that text is? All right, you can see how nicely it's written, how clear it's got all the dots and dashes, all the marginal indications that you would need to help you learn how to read it and copy it. This is in Russia, you can see Leningrad. Um, we actually have a copy of it in St. Charles. If you are ever allowed again to go to St. Charles, um, there is a, a copy of this and it's a huge fat book. And this is the cover of the book, which is why I have the picture there. So this is the basis for our Bibles today. Okay, the Leningrad Codex. So I'll just show you this. So this is what they try to do is to take what is written and they put it into a nice typed block. And you can see they try to put the dots and they do, they put all the dots and dashes. And this is your uh, Hebrew Bible. So I have it here. This is your um, Biblia Hebraica and you can open. So basically what this is, it's the Leningrad Codex. I don't know if you can see this anyway, right there. So anyway, it's the Leningrad Codex. And then they will look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. They will look at the Greek translation to maybe correct or fix the text if it needs to be corrected or fixed where they can't read it. So they will read it. Uh, basically, this is our, our Old Testament then, our Hebrew Old Testament is the Leningrad Codex with an eye to other witnesses filling in the blanks when the text is corrupted, when it doesn't make sense by looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and by looking at, um, and by looking at uh, uh, maybe, maybe the Greek translation as well. Okay, so let's pause there and see if there's any questions. That was probably a lot, but let me see, how, how are we doing? Yeah, I'm just talking to a screen and I think it's really fascinating. And then I go back and I see my students and. And I, I can't figure out why they're not as fascinated as I am. Okay, we're good, we can go on then. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so. Okay, now, when we go to the Greek Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament, as we said, the Greek Old Testament was translated probably about the second to third century BC. And it was probably, well, I mean, it's, it's quite sure it was done in, in Egypt, um, in Alexandria. We have three major codices for the Greek text. Now the, the New Testament was written in Greek, all right? Not Hebrew, the New Testament is written in Greek. So these, Greek codices 
are both the Greek Old Testament and the New Testament. All right, so they are massive. So they serve as textual witnesses for both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, these are almost all, uh, where's my cursor? Digitize, I'll just show you some of these. So this is the, uh, you can see the text is online, the Codex uh, Sinaiticus. Uh, I thought I brought it up, hang on. Oh. This was the uh... oh. Anyway, the digitized version is on here somewhere. Oh, see the manuscript. Could be clear, right? Yes, there. Why don't we see the manuscript? All right. So we start out with. See, we're in Genesis 21. So this is where it begins, right? You can see again the fragments. And you need uh, a lot of patience in order to uh, take a look at this. So here's another page. This is actually another part that you can go through here and you can see the books of the Old Testament that are witnessed to. So parts of Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then Joshua, Judges, Chronicles, two uh, Chronicles, uh, the first Chronicles there twice, Ezra, Esther, Tobit, Judith, Maccabees, one and four. We then have the prophets, some wisdom songs, some wisdom books, and then we move on to the New Testament. Okay. This would be the oldest complete Greek Old Testament and New Testament that we have, a complete one. Now we have ones which are older, but this one is complete. So this remains a very important uh, manuscript for us, all right? And it is, um, housed now in the British Museum. It was found in 1844 in a monastery in Sinai, and that's why it's called Sinaiticus. Um, and again, it's a big fight, right? The monks want their, they want their manuscript back. They feel like it was stolen from them. And um, I'll let you guess if the uh, Brits are willing to turn it over to them. <laughs> They're keeping it in their museum. Um, so there's a little bit of tension regarding that. The next one, we can be very proud of this is Codex Vaticanus, and that is housed in the Vatican Museum. This is probably the second oldest. It seems that it's, well, it, it is. It's the second oldest uh, text that we have. Whoops, sorry. And this dates from the, um, this is the fourth century. And if you are interested in taking a look at that, you can see this. You can play around and take a look at some of these. Uh, Now, this is actually quite well done. This website is easier to use. So we have a few just blank pages. And then oh, we have a table of contents. This is clearly added later. But here, I'll just show you this. If you take a look, Genesis was, um, let me get down to page 41. So this is kind of, we're getting to the end of Genesis and you can sort of see, well, you get, I don't know what you can see, but if you can take a look at this writing, notice that you've got all these dots and dashes and the writing is almost like lowercase. That is an indication that this is later. All right, this is a later text. And so this is the book of Genesis and the book of Genesis was missing. And then it seems to have been added later. Look what happens when you go to Exodus. You see how the writing changes? You see how it's now block writing? There's no spaces. There's almost no accents added. And the quality of the, of the page also decreases substantially. In some places, you can't even see the letters because it's so light. This is a good page here. This is a nice clear one, actually. Some cases, they were, they were written over. Yeah, you can see right there. All right, so it's a complete manuscript, but parts of it are later and parts of it are original. And you can tell that very clearly from the, from the writing. See, so just take a look at that again, and then I'll show you one of the older pages and you can see the difference in that. See how the writing is, is completely changed. Yeah, okay. 
So this is an interesting document too, very, um, very important. And thanks be to God, these things are online so people can have access to them and look at them. The Alexandrinus is a fifth century. All right, so Sinaiticus and Vaticanus of fourth century AD manuscripts. Alexandrinus is a later one, it's a fifth century, but this in some ways is the mother of all codices. And this is a shame because only the New Testament has been digitized online. It's actually four volumes. And it's, it's, um, it's very, very difficult to get a copy and look at the Old Testament texts. Um, that's a shame. But at any rate, the new, this is in the British Museum. And, and, and from what I understand, it's just the writing is just too, too light. It's too uh, corrupted in some places to even try to digitize it. That's how bad it is. But the New Testament is not that bad. And so they can digitize the New Testament and they have done that. Um, so. And there's the table of contents that's clearly added later. You can see by the writing. Look, you guys could all read that. You see Evangel, that's your gospels, Evangel. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is the British Museum, so we're very grateful for their, uh, their nice indications. Uh, and then here's the text itself, which is clearly not written in English. Okay, so you can see uh, these are the gospels then. Okay, all right, so. So these are these three are very, very important manuscripts, both for the Greek Old Testament and for determining the New Testament. So those would be our major witnesses for the Old Testament. Now we have some books in the Old Testament which were not written in Hebrew. Say Judith, the Book of Wisdom. Okay, so we don't use the Leningrad Codex because it's not going to have them. They weren't written in Hebrew. Right, so we have we have only then these Greek texts that we use. Okay. So let me stop there then before we move on to some of the New Testament witnesses. Any, any questions or thoughts on that? I hope this is clear. Okay, all right, good. Let's keep going then, very good. Okay, now the New Testament, the New Testament, we have literally thousands thousands of witnesses of the New Testament. And generally they are divided into three types based on their, um, their writing. So the oldest, oldest New Testament witnesses we have are papyri, this is papyrus. And we have about a hundred of them. Now they're not complete. Okay, some of them are fragments and I'll show you some of these. And these, uh, we have about a hundred of them and they date anywhere from the second to the eighth century AD. And we designate them with a P followed by a number. And the number doesn't mean that it's oldest. Like P1 is not the oldest. It means it was just found first. All right, so P20 is not necessarily older than P80. It's just that there, as we find them, they give as we, okay, as they find them, they continue to give them numbers. Then the text, what I just showed you, remember those block Greek, so those like block texts, those are called unciels or mayuscules. And so the most famous of these are going to be Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, and Vaticanus. There's about 300 known manuscripts dating anywhere from the fourth to the 10th century. And these were originally designated with letters, but the letters ran out, right? There's only so many letters. And so they went to a number system. And what they do is they put a zero followed by the number then. Now the system had already started. So Alexandrinus got A, Vaticanus got B, but Sinaiticus was only discovered in 1844. So that immediately got bumped up. They gave it the first Hebrew letter, just to confuse everyone. And then when they added the numbers, they made that one one, Alexandrinus, although it's A, it's two, and Vaticanus B is three. Now, minuscules, there's our th literally thousands of these. And they are later, they're dated anywhere from the eighth to the 15th century. And these are designated by numbers, not beginning with the zero. So I just have some pictures then. I took this from the Greek New Testament. All right, this is the fourth, uh, 20, sorry, sorry, the 27th edition. And these are just in the back. So this is the, the Greek and Latin codices which were used in this edition. So these are the Greek ones, okay? So there's your papyrus number one. This is the year it's dated to, and this is where it is. And isn't that nice that we are at the top of the list? 
Look at that Philadelphia right here. So they share this text with uh, two other universities. Okay, so then P2 is a sixth century and that's in uh, Italy and they also share it with Egypt. And so then you can go on and see all of these texts and you can see the centuries in which they were found and what they have. So these are not complete manuscripts. For example, P1 only has a little bit of Matthew there, right? Just parts of Matthew chapter one. P2 just has a little bit of John. P3 just has a little bit of Luke, so on and so forth. This one is Romans. This is the first letter of John. You see that. This is the for one Kings. Okay. The reason I put this in here is because P52 is the oldest witness to the New Testament that we have. P52. Look at that. That's second century. All right. And that attests, that is a witness to John chapter 18. And so I just put that in there. This is it. This is our papyrus 52, John. And this is dated anywhere from 100 to 135 AD. So this is the oldest empirical thing that we can hold in our hands regarding the New Testament. So this is the front and then that's the back. So it's pretty clear. And then I include this, so we keep going through our papyri, we keep going, we get to P98, and then we start with our mayusculas or uncio. So these are capital letters written, these are manuscripts then. They're not written on papyrus, um, they're written on parchment. And you can see there's your cineaticus, right? Because we know our symbols now, right? There's our crazy Hebrew letter in our O1. There's our Alexandrinus, O2. And there's our Vaticanus, O3. And then we keep on going. And you can see that they've got the, um, the E there stands for the Gospels, Acts, um, Paul, and then uh, uh, a Revelation. Okay, so these are some more examples. So this is um, the extent of the manuscripts. We go to 300 and then we start our minusculates. All right, so these are these are ones that are designated without the zero in front. And so here we start with one, two. They didn't use all of them in this edition. And you can see here the years are quite a bit later, right? 13th century, 15th, 12th, as opposed to the um, mayuscules, the uncios, look at that, 5th century, 6th. So we take kind of a leap here, don't we? We're getting much later. Okay, I just thought, just because we have nothing else to do, I thought I would just talk about one particular text, which might be now considered the oldest papyri of the New Testament. So you see your 7Q, right? So this was found in the seventh cave at Qumran and it's designated number five. Now, this is a picture of the fragment. Now, there's this is hotly debated, boy. I can tell you, this is really, there's no agreement among scholars. This is the, this is it, right? Now, this is probably the most, so this is this is the the writing of this fellow named O'Callaghan, and he is really fighting for the fact that this is a fragment of Mark, that there's a fragment of Mark that was found in the Qumran community in 1947. This was found a little bit later. Okay, so the ones in the red are going to correspond to what we see over here, and they correspond down here to the letters in English, more or less. Okay, so this is Mark 6:52 to 53. All right, so let's just do a quick look. You've got one two, three, four, five lines, right? Okay, now let's go to our fragment. I'll move us over here. I can't, oh, we, we don't wanna go up, do we? All right, so I'll move us over there. Okay, I only see four lines, all right? One, two, three, four. All right, so where he's getting this, I have no idea, but apparently he did some computer work and he found a letter up there. All right, so he found that letter. All right, all right. All right, God bless him, he's trying. All right, then we go down to this line. He finds one, two, three, four, space, five letters. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I don't know, I just don't know, okay? I mean, I see maybe one, so this guy right here, that's a T, you see that T? So that's gonna correspond with that T right there, the tau. 
All right, that's your omega. I see an omega. I'm following you. I see that. Okay, see the omega? All right, that's your omega. That's fine. Maybe that's a nu because T omega nu is extremely, uh, that's a, that, that would be an N. Okay, so that's like a V. It looks like a V, but that's an N. Uh, yeah, I, I, could, I could see that. That's fine. But then there's a little hole there. And so I don't, and he says that he sees this, this that's a U there. He says he can detect the U through a computer work. I don't know. Okay, so go down to this one. Then we've got a letter, a space. Okay, the period's not there. And then we have a K. That's an A and an I, a D and an I. All right, I see the K. All right, you see the K. I see the A. All right, you see the A. This is your alpha. I see the I. This would function as a D. All right, all right. Maybe another I. This line is, is the clearest of all of them. Okay, then we have these two V letters. These are Ns. That functions as an eta. That's like an A and then that's an S. All right, I can see that. There's the N. There's the other N. This is your eta right, right here. And then it goes, this is the eta. It's like an H. See kind of the H there. And then it goes into an S. I can kind of see the S. And then down here, he's finding four letters. All right, I see the A, I see the H, I see the H, I see the S. All right, so I'm seeing this over here. So anyway, scholars look at this and some are like, holy moly, the guy's a genius, this is Mark. And others look at it and say, yeah, all right, well, bless his heart. God bless him, he's trying. All right, I, I, I don't really know what to make of it. I don't know. What is the argument, the other argument for the fact that this might be from the Gospel of Mark is that they have run these letters through the computer and there is no other Greek text that has this combination except Mark. So even if you take out these letters and you put in the minimal letters and you try to figure out what other text it could be, nothing comes up. So it's either a text we don't know or maybe indeed it is Mark, maybe indeed it is. So the evidence is what the evidence is. We don't really have much more than that. But if we have that boy, and we can date this to 50 AD, then the Gospel of Mark, now that doesn't mean that the whole Gospel of Mark was written in 50 AD, does it? But it does mean that there was at least some witness, some kind of a textual witness to this. And that is quite early. If the Lord died in 30, which he, which he did around 30 or so, um, this is a quite an early attestation. It, it would be the, the, the earliest we think, the scholars think that the New Testament was written the earliest book was probably 1 Thessalonians in about 50 to 54. So this would jump all the way to the front. See how now Mark would become the oldest, uh, I mean, depending. Okay. All right. So that's our, our manuscript tradition. All right, any, any thoughts or questions on that before we move on? How are we doing for time? We're gonna make it, we're gonna make it. That was a lot. But that's 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 the most important because it's the most empirical. Okay, good. Let's keep going then. All right. So number two is the events. The events. Now everything everything in scripture is controversial. So uh, I put a line here. These are the major events that we would want to know. So the patriarchs is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we see some dates there. The Exodus, Moses and the Exodus, and then Joshua, they enter into the land and judges. And then you see, I've got this line here. All right, and that line demarcates the fourth, four millennia ago versus three millennia, because notice around the kingdom of, around the time of David, we are almost at a thousand BC on the nose. All right, so the reign of David is about 1,000 BC, 3,000 years ago. At this point, there is really no debate about these years. Okay, at this point, there are multiple vectors from Egyptian sources, Assyrian sources, Babylonian sources, and we know that these years to be quite factual. Nobody argues that the Israelites were destroyed in 722. We all know that. Nobody argues that the exile was in 587 to 537. All right, so if we see these events being written about, 
we can place them pretty pretty closely to the event or at least when the event happened the controversy is going to be regarding 4000 years ago right the events prior to 1000 bc because here there are no extra biblical witnesses all right so this gets very very difficult and very dicey um i think we have time to do how scholars might try to date something when they don't have uh, a lot of evidence so i thought what we could do now notice the years that i put down there 1250 all right this is by whoops by no means there is wide agreement to this so let me just give you the two plausible or possible dates for the exodus okay so we only have the biblical tradition to go by there's no archaeological evidence for this um, there's no other papyri that speak about this this is all that we have so you have those who fight for what they call the early date and then you have those who fight for the later date 1250 so we have some biblical evidence for the early date let's take a look at this really quickly 1 Kings 6 1. So um, we'll go to the Bible program here. In the 400th and 80th year from the departure of the Israelites from the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, in the month of Ziv, the second month, the construction of the temple of the Lord was begun. Okay. The fourth year of Solomon's reign is probably 966. All right, we don't argue one or two years when we're talking nearly three millennia ago. 480 years prior to that would place the Exodus at 1445. Okay, let's go to Judges 11.6. Oops, sorry. Sorry, 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 that, that's a mistake. 1126. When Israel, this is a discussion, so we're kind of in the middle of the dialogue, which is why it doesn't make too much sense. Let's, let's read the NIV. For 300 years, Israel occupied Heshbon, Arari, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you take them during that time? Okay, 300 years. So, the guy who is speaking here is Jephthah. And what Jephthah is in effect saying is that the Israelites had been occupying the city of Heshbon for 300 years. So these cities were taken by Israel just before they came into the promised land, just before they invaded Cana. Okay, if the possession occurred about 340 years before Jephthah, then we're looking again at a round of date of 1445. There's one more bit of evidence for this earlier date as well. And that's the so-called Armana tablets. Now these date to the Pharaoh Akhenaten. Akhenaten is, um, is well known because he's the first non-Israelite to espouse monotheism. Okay, now at this time, the land of Canaan is under Egyptian control. And he ruled from 1400 to 1350 uh, BC, and we have these tablets, these letters that he sent in correspondence to people who were living in Canaan at the time. And basically, he's speaking about these these folks who are coming in and settling the land and causing this kind of disruption. And some say, well, there you go, it's the Hebrews. But others say, well, they might just have been mercenaries. Okay, how do people that espouse a later date account for this? Well, it's actually they would say something like numbers can often be symbolic in the Old Testament, aren't they? These group of people who were settling the land of Cana during this time of when the Armana tablets were being written, 1400 to 1350, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were Hebrews. They could have been anybody from anywhere. And do we even know that they were, that the word, that so the word they use is Aparu. Are the Aparu even Hebrews? Maybe they're like mercenaries. Maybe it means something like pirates. Maybe it doesn't mean a race of people. Maybe it means things that they're doing. Like we would say today, uh, uh, yeah, mercenaries or pirates or something like that. Okay, so the argument goes on. Well, what about the other date? Well, 
They point to biblical evidence, Exodus 1, 11. Let's go to Exodus 1, 11. And taskmasters were set over the Israelites, here we can read the NAV, to oppress them with forced labor. Thus they had to build for Pharaoh the supply cities of Pithom and Ramses. We know that Ramses was a prolific builder, the Pharaoh Ramses, Ramses II. He ruled from 1279 to maybe 1224, maybe a little bit after that. Also, there is um, uh, artwork at this time, which would art, artwork on certain buildings, which showed uh, the making of bricks and the building um, of buildings, which is quite similar to the description here of the making of bricks. Okay, so it seems very logical to assume that the Pharaoh who was constructing the cities of Ramses was in fact Ramses the Pharaoh. There's also one other bit of evidence too that we can look at. Um, this is in Numbers 22. If you go to Numbers 22. And so they went forward, the Israelites moved on and camp on the plains of Moab. And then we have all this, this situation here with the Moabites and they have all kinds of issues with the Moabites. But if you look at the time period, okay, 1440 and so on, the land of Moab at that point was, was unoccupied. There was nobody there. Archeology span shows it had not yet been settled. The land of Moab is on the, um, the western part of the Jordan. So it's in the Transjordan area, the desert area. So when was the Exodus? We don't know. If we don't know when it was, how can we know when the writing was? I tend, personally, I'm not Jesus and I could be wrong. I tend to think that the later date, there's more evidence that puts that together. Okay, so dating events can be very easy depending on when they are. Okay, if we're in these time, not a problem. But boy, you go back to that fourth millennia BC and it's, it gets really dicey, it gets very difficult. Abraham has been dated anywhere from 1800 to 1400. Uh, okay, so that's the events. Then we go down to some others, external witnesses. This is usually for the New Testament, but we can use it for the old. Well, what, do, what writings do we have from ancient people and what do they say? Well, we have Christian authors, Christian writers who lived after the generation of the apostles. And here's just one of the books. It's called the Apostolic Fathers. This is a particular edition, but they're all over. And these are the ones, so these are the generation after the apostles. So you have Jesus. Um, Jesus died in 30. Peter and Paul most surely died in the early 60s. And then you've got those people, maybe he grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, so they would have known the apostles, and they die maybe 90, 100, 110. All right, so those folks there who die around 90, 100, 110, that generation, they're called the apostolic fathers. All right, and the best known of them are going to be these three, Clement of Rome, who dies in 99. So he didn't know the Lord. Okay, Jesus died in 30, too, 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 too early. But he did know the apostles, apparently. Ignatius of Antioch, who died in 110, and Polycarp of Smyrna, who dies in 115. So we know their names. Two others are Barnabas, anywhere from 70 to 132, and the shepherd of Hermes. He's a little late, but he might even be earlier than that. And then we have those who remain anonymous. Whoever wrote the Didache, whoever wrote the martyrdom of Polycarp, and then we have this certain letter. All right, so about seven works here, which are included in the Apostolic Fathers. So what do scholars do? They comb through these works to see what they know. Are they quoting the Gospel of John? Like in 99, was the Gospel of John so well known that Clement of Rome can quote it? Right, you see what they're trying to look for there? Did Clement of Rome know the book of Revelation? Okay, so these works have been combed through to see what they knew about the Gospels. And here's, or in the, the New Testament, here's just a quick summary. Paul is well cited. Paul is well known. His letters are alluded to and cited with frequency. The words of Jesus are also cited and they are normative. 
His words are normative, and in some cases, they're even cited as scripture because there's a technical phrase, as it is written, blah, 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 okay? And so his words have that authority. The Gospel of Matthew seems to be the most deployed. It seems to be the most circulated in the early church. And the one who seems to have made little impact is the Gospel of John. So when Jesus's words are quoted by the apostolic fathers, and they speak of things that he says, they will often rely on the Gospel of Matthew. Now, what does that tell us? Precisely nothing, right? It doesn't mean that because they quoted them, it doesn't mean they don't know them, or they don't quote them, they don't know them. Maybe they just don't quote them. Maybe they like Matthew. Maybe Matthew's more accessible. Maybe the guy who wrote the manuscripts of Matthew had better handwriting. I mean, we could come up with any number of reasons why this might be. Okay, so things are getting a little you know, harder to, to, to figure out. Okay, linguistics, linguistics. Here, what we look for are ancient uses of words that are examined. And then we look for loan words from Egypt, from Persia and Greece. There's a lot of Egyptian words actually in the Pentateuch. Some people think that Torah, the Pentateuch was later, but there, there's, there's a, a lot of loan words from Egypt in there. Moses is a long word. Moses is not a, is not a Hebrew name. It's, a, it's, a, it's an Egyptian name. And even if someone uses old language, you can drive around Philadelphia and go to, oh, ye old hail house, right? Look at that there. <laughs> yes, you can go have a beer. So do you see the point? Even though we might use this old language in certain ways, it doesn't mean that we talk this way. So a guy 300 years from now, oh, they're still using old English in Philadelphia. Well, no, they're not. They're not. It's just an archaic form that we can pull out to maybe make people have, feel a sense of maybe tradition. And certainly the scriptures do that. They certainly will do that. You can see sometimes they're writing in one way and then all of a sudden they go back and they'll use some archaic terms in order to recall events from the past. So sometimes we can use it for dating and sometimes we can't. All right, so just because someone today might speak in a Shakespearean English doesn't mean that he lived in 1500 in, in England. Okay, themes. Now this actually is a little bit more helpful than we might think. There are certain themes that come up later. This idea of a judgment after death is later. All right, we don't find anything like that in the oldest literature. It's not in the Torah. It's not there. It doesn't exist. It will only come probably around the Persian era. So let's go back to our events really quickly. It seems to come up here. Only here does this idea of a, some kind of a judgment after death come up. We also get these texts which begin to speak about this figure of wisdom who was before the creation of the world. Again, that idea, we don't find it here. David, we never hear David speaking about wisdom. We don't hear it in the Psalms. It's not there. That seems to be something that was developed during the Persian period. The other thing that is developed, these themes, let's go back to our themes. This is a fascinating idea, is the person as sacred space. There's this theology that develops probably after the destruction of the temple that because God breathed into man and he became a living being, that the person can be likened to the temple. The person is sacred and holy. And the later literature really goes to town with that theme. You only see one Psalm that speaks about that. That's it, as far as I can tell. I only see that in one Psalm. But boy, it's all over the Song of Songs. It's all over the book of Judith. And these, when were these written? All right, the Song of Songs, probably the Persian period, probably. And Judith might even be a little bit later. She might have even been during the Maccabean era. Okay, so you can kind of see that development of ideas. And then finally, types of writing. Apocalyptic writing. So apocalyptic writing envisions the end of one era and the beginning of another. And so there's a huge fight in which one era ends and then we're on the cusp of a new era where evil is finally defeated. So here's your four horsemen. We don't find apocalyptic writing before Isaiah and Ezekiel. 
Now we can pretty much figure out when Isaiah was, okay? Isaiah's around here, just before the exile, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit earlier than that. All right, so apocalyptic writing begins to be developed right around this time period. And then boy, does it take off. All right, so we don't find anything like that in the Pentateuch. It's just not there. Apocalyptic writing isn't there. It does it, so judgment after death, the person of sacred space, apocalyptic, apocalyptic writing, messianic predictions, the fact that there's going to be a new king who will come. That is also something that starts right around here. Well, maybe, maybe the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. All right, messianism, the idea that we're going to get a new king who will come and be the king whom God wants to, who will be the king who, whom, who, who will finally establish the kingdom of God. Again, we don't see that over here, right? Moses isn't talking about a king, this king who's going to come. It's just not there. So the predictions of Jesus began around 700 BC. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Who was predicting us around 700 years ago? Okay. We only have no minutes left. <laughs> can I Can I have just a few more minutes? Is, is that all right? Can I go over? If you have to go, just go. Um, Let's take all that together and try to apply it to Psalm 1. All right, let's take these criteria and see what we can do with Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is a gorgeous psalm. Let's just take a quick look at it. It leads the collection of the psalms. So it's a short one. And we start out with the idea of happier blessedness, blessed. And so happy people don't do three things. Happy, and that is a horrible translation. We're going to get rid of it right now. We're going to get a nice translation okay blessed is the man yes the hebrew the greek and the latin it's all singular male so we're going to do that blessed is the man who does not do this he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked that is he doesn't follow their advice he doesn't stand in the way of sinners he doesn't listen to them and follow their ways and he doesn't sit in the seat of mockers that is he doesn't stay with those who scorn god who mock god he is totally, absolutely divorced from anything that is evil. All right, well, what does this guy do? He delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law, he meditates day and night. Okay, now, my good scholars, look at this. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in season. Its leaves do not wither. Now, John, and Mary, you're not allowed to answer this. What does that make us think of? If we're good Jews and we hear about trees which don't die, whose fruit is perennial, what are we thinking of? Why don't I just tell you? Okay, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, right? This man becomes like a tree of life. Right, he has something of the eternity now dwelling in him. Okay, all right, good. I think someone actually said it. Oh, 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 wait, wait, let me go back and share. I gotta share, okay. But not so the wicked, not so. They just go away. Okay, they're like chaff that the wind blows away. And then look at this, we have a judgment scene. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. It's doomed, they're doomed. So we have this two ways, the way of righteous and the way of not being righteous. Okay, okay, let's go through our manuscript tradition. The Dead Sea, Psalm one is only in one, there's only one verse of it and it's in this particular document and it's only one line. So we don't really have anything in the manuscript tradition in, in the Dead Sea. Oh. Um, some later script traditions, later Hebrew traditions, combine Psalms 1 and 2. Hmm. So Psalms 1 and 2 are one psalm. If you go to Acts 13.33, where they are quoting Psalm 2.7, and it says, in the second psalm, it says, and then it goes and it quotes the psalm. A couple of codices read the first psalm. There's also a difference between the Greek and the Hebrew. The Greek is a little bit longer because we don't have time. I won't show you. 
All right, so let's just keep that in the back of our mind. There's a tradition where the Psalms were either combined or Psalm 1 maybe wasn't even there. Okay, the events depict a judgment scene, perhaps after death. That indicates it's pretty late. Linguistics, nothing unusual. Type of writing, the wisdom literature, you're good or you're bad, right? You follow the law or you don't. This is very typical of the later literature. There's not this idea of, oh, well, you know, his mother didn't love him. No, he's bad. He's bad. He's not following the law. That's it. You got the two ways. And then you've got themes in the writing. Okay, so if we go through this, I won't do this just in the interest of time. If you take away Psalm 1, the book is actually very well structured. The Psalms are divided into five sections, probably like the Psalms of, of, of uh, like, like the book of the Torah, five books. Psalm 2 is a royal psalm. Okay, it's talking about the Messiah. I've installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. And then Psalm 72. Look at how it ends. This concludes. Okay, so we have praise. Okay. And then this concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. 72 is a royal psalm about Solomon. Solomon, Solomon taking over the throne. So Psalm 2 is God installing the king. Psalm 72, where there's a clear ending, is Solomon taking over. We can look at all of this together and conclude that maybe the best conclusion might be that Psalm 1 was added later. Maybe it was a later kind of addition and serves as some sort of an introduction to the Psalter. And so the whole Psalter begins with the idea of being happy and being blessed and by following the law. And here, I just wanna say one more thing and then I promise I'm done. Let's just go back to that Psalm one. Notice the blessed man is a singular male. Blessed is the man. That's why I like this translation. His delight. He is where the wicked are plural. Third person plural. Who is this one man who has lived out the vision of Psalm 1 and has become a tree of life? Messiah. Yes. The answer is always Jesus. Right? That's what I tell my students. Just write Jesus a couple times or love and you'll be fine. There you go. Yes. Yes. Do you see how it speaks of Jesus then? That's right. He's the one who lives out this radical vision of not, um, of, 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 of not having anything to do with evil and completely ensconced in the law of the Lord and becomes a tree of life for us, of course, on the cross, right? Where his side is open and the blood and water flow out to nourish us and give us life. We had to end with something spiritual. We can't keep it completely technical. Okay. All right, very good. Um, I, I imagine maybe you'd like to go, but if you'd like to have questions, I'm happy to stay as long as you would like. All right, Mary, I think you wanted to say something. No, I just wanted to thank you. And um, I, I, this has been tremendous. And I hope there's not going to be a test on any of this. No, 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 just, no. I, my head is spinning, but it's been absolutely fascinating. So I don't know. Does anybody have any questions? I don't even know if I could articulate a question at this point, but. Hi, my name's Anne. Um, yes, I feel the same way, Mary. I couldn't articulate a question, but I was wondering, um, the links that were embedded in the in your slides, do you think that could be emailed to us somehow so we could just click the link instead of trying to copy exactly? Okay, great. Thank you so yep. much. Yep. I'd be happy to do that. Mary, Thank perhaps you. I'll send that to you. Is, is that okay? That'd be great. And okay. then I'll post the slides as well as the recording. That would make it easier to get through. Okay, good, good. Thank you. So what we'll do then when we come back, we'll take some of this criteria and we'll go into the Pentateuch. Okay, the first five books. So make sure you read them all. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, we'll go through and I'll just pull out a couple of what I think maybe are the more interesting parts. And we'll try to date them. Okay, we'll try to see when certain sections of the of the Torah were written and maybe who wrote them and see and see what what it what it might mean. Okay. Um, 
All right, good. Well, gosh, I can't believe you made it to the end. <laughs> that was a that was a very very good. It was a, it was a lot, but I felt okay doing it because I knew that it was being recorded, so you can go back and listen to it if you if you wanted to do that. No, it was thrilling. It was just That's terrific. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you. That was great. See you next time. Thank you. All right. Let's end with a quick prayer then, okay? Let's just say glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All right. God bless. bless. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. We'll see you Thank next you, week. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Bye-bye.